I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, this morning. I'm actually taking a couple of extra flights and missing naming a post office uh, to be able to join you. I think this conversation uh, and the collection of people that are here focusing on these issues uh, is absolutely critical on a whole host of other things. Uh, I think, uh, as Nico posited all sorts of interesting dynamics going forward, uh, much of which I agree with and won't repeat, I, I couldn't do it as well as he did. Although I think there are some real challenges in terms of the timing and phasing of some of these implications. But this is the tip of the spear. It's not just transportation and land use and livability. What we're talking about here is a way to be able to help shape our future, not being run over by it, be able to harness the forces of change to solve problems rather than to create the new, new ones. I've gone over my remarks this morning about 12 different times, I will say, and I'm going to try and actually be brief. Uh, it's tough when somebody who's talking for a living uh, is sort of given the microphone and 20 minutes. Uh, lucky for you, I do have a plane to catch. Um, I will not be tempted to get carried away. I am tempted to get carried away. I'll try not to. Um, part of my enthusiasm is because the themes you're talking about here are the things that keep me up night. And by the same token, these very same elements are the exciting elements that make me eager to go to work in the morning. There must be some reason you'd be eager to go to work in Congress. Well, these are the elements that we're working with. And I must confess, well, first of all, I have sort of a love-hate relationship with technology. Um, I tweet because I have to. Um, I find Facebook an amazing time sink. I don't self-check out at supermarkets because I want that connection with a real live human being to, uh, some of them actually have uh, family wage jobs. But the tweet brings me closer together to literally tens of thousands of supporters and in some cases friends. The technology enabled 1.6 million people to hear from me directly why I was not going back to Washington, D.C. to listen to Donald Trump's State of the Union speech. I think there's a basic tenet on Let's, let me pause it. Actually, your federal government sucks these days. <laughs> Donald Trump and Congress deserve each other. <laughs> but the public doesn't deserve either one. And there's no better example of the dysfunction, the opportunity, and the problems ahead is what we have not been able to do putting together an infrastructure program. Everybody wanted to spend a trillion, a trillion and a half dollars. God knows America's falling apart while it's falling behind. It used to be an area of broadly shared bipartisan interest and in action. We made some mistakes along the way, turning our rivers into machines, um, what we did with the automobile in our cities, but we've learned from many of those lessons in the past. Uh, academics and practitioners can tell us how to do it better. But as a nation, we too often have stopped trying to do it better. One of the things that's kind of positive going forward, it's not just uh, the infrastructure that's falling apart. Uh, America is uh, that relationship with the automobile, that love affair, is cooling a little bit. Some want a trial separation. Others are ready for a divorce. For most of the last century, the car was king, shaped so much of how we lived, how we moved, how we invested. The local economies were often devoted in a very significant way to the care and feeding 
of the automobile. It's still the second largest expenditure for most families. For many, it's actually the largest. It has led to the demise of our urban centers. Uh, but isn't it interesting watching how particularly millennials have a different attitude, willing to cut that cord? I really believe that the dynamic that's taking place with the automobile, with technology, with e-commerce, automation, um, these are perhaps the most visible and useful ways for us to attack much larger, broader areas of dysfunction and opportunity. Part of what's going to shock us into action, and Nico referenced this, uh, we're going to see the collapse of the financing model for transportation infrastructure. Now, it hasn't been helped by the fact that uh, we haven't <laughs> raised the gas tax in a quarter century. Uh, despite the legislation I've had to do so, broadly supported by virtually everybody who finances, uses, maintains, and operates transportation systems. But it's not just fuel taxes. For local government, parking fees, which are going to be different, traffic fines, those autonomous vehicles are probably not going to be caught speeding very often, and the financing model uh, is going to force change. The Oregon experiment that a number of you have been a part of, probably, how many of you are, are uh, 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 paying by the mile? I thought more of you early adapters would be uh, part of that. Uh, it, Oregon is leading the way. There's a dozen other states that are moving in this direction, as you know. And it's no longer sort of arts and crafts. It's not a novelty. It's a necessity. And a relatively small change of that road pricing model will be congestion pricing. It's such a spectacular success in the three places that really have it, that it's, it's tough going. It's a real mindset change that's necessary. There's some technological aspects to it. But I think of all the areas of adaptation and change, I think you're going to see congestion pricing move forward rather quickly. The technological platform that would support road user charge, congestion fee, uh, will be more than just keeping track and paying for road use. The potential here of a seamless transportation system that will take care of all your mobility needs, whether it's transit, bike share, car share, Lyft, Uber, Amtrak, if we're still going to have it, um, with one little passport. really dramatically changing that relationship with the automobile, providing personal needs, everything people want, and it'll plan and direct it for us. With no investment in a car, or maintenance, or you know, just a monthly fee, and you won't have to wash it, park it, service it, or ever buy a car again. And for a lot of people, that's going to be an exciting aspect for the future. There are some implementation challenges because this works great for urban America, many cities in red and blue states can identify with this and move forward. Not so much for rural and small town America. So part of what we need to be doing is working on a different political agreement. In part, what is driving many of our, trans most of our transportation expenditures is congestion. And we find people who are causing the congestion are often willing to pay quite a bit more. It's worth it. UPS, five minutes delay for their delivery, $50 million a year. 
That's why we're watching business, the U.S. Chamber, uh, the American Trucking Association, saying, raise our transportation fees. But for rural and small town America, with legislators that have a disproportionate influence in Salem and in Washington, D.C., we ought to think about structuring a different bargain. Give, give them a discount, frankly. They're not contributing that much to the congestion equation. And they have a stake in urban mobility as well. As we traveled the state with the last transportation program, people in rural Oregon are concerned about getting product to market. So let's think about cutting a deal with a little lower rate for people that aren't contributing as much to the congestion problem and who exercise outside political influence. Now we have some regions, I think, that are maybe poised to take the plunge, like we had the Waymo experiment, where people are they're ready to go autonomous, go for it. Although I continue to think that uh, the hang up here is in no small measure is going to turn on some liability questions as we move forward that I don't think we've entirely sorted out. My friend Robin might be talking about some of that with all sorts of other magic that she will betray, be, uh, bestow upon you. I'm cranky that I'm going to have to miss it. Um, there are private companies, I think, that are poised to be able to swoop in in some early adapters and offer to just take it off our hands, to have sort of a turnkey operation to manage all of this. Amazon, Comcast, you know, a great big HMO for mobility. Um, there's some potential there. And there's also some potential, as Nico referenced, to some significant downside. I think we've got to be very careful to treat these developments like the public utilities that they are. We not, must not stumble into public-private partnerships that aren't fully transparent and where the public interest is not fully protected. No more Chicago parking meter uh, scams um, or problems with the Indiana Turnpike. This must be done very carefully, very intentionally to make sure that we are getting full benefit out of it and that the value that's going to be created, and I think there's going to be a great deal of value that's going to be created and redistributed, is properly applied. Income inequality and mobility inequality, housing inequality, these all ought to be at the top of the list and they are integrated, combined, there's some solutions that we can work on together. One of the things I want to see come out of this quickly as we move to congestion pricing, and I think we'll raise the fuel tax in an interim, is to be able to capture and redirect those revenues on a broad-based infrastructure program to rebuild and renew this country, and not just transportation. What's under the surface, sewer and water, is actually in worse shape than the surfaces. And they're going to be challenged tremendously by different patterns of growth and climate change and resilience. There are millions of family wage jobs that aren't going to be outsourced that can actually be distributed pretty uniformly across the country if we get this right. I'm really excited about the program that you have today. If I, if I had my way, I would sort of sentence every one of my colleagues to sit back and reflect on this and reflect on how we are going 
to enter into a partnership with the, for the future with the citizens whose lives potentially could be dramatically enhanced, but there's going to be a lot of disruption and problem in the short term. The fact that we are taking away, in many cases, the largest source of employment for men without a college education over the course of the next decade, there's some disruption here. The same way in manufacturing and transportation, there were an opportunity to repurpose, uh, to be able to train and redirect to deal with the rebuilding and renewing of this country. But it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take bringing the public with us. I'd like to think that some of the things we did in the city of Portland as we tried to grow a light rail line into a system when there wasn't the greatest degree of regional trust and in fact at that point the public wasn't entirely sure that it was a big fan of light rail. One of the gubernatorial candidates the month before it opened suggested that the solution to financing Max was to leave the key in it and hope somebody stole it. The other major candidate at that time who was identified with Max had a campaign talking to us about maybe delaying the opening because they thought it would be such a bust that it would hurt his election. And it didn't, actually we ran into problems with Washington County who wasn't really excited about West Side Max. Maybe they would agree to it if we'd agree to the West Side Bypass. Times changed. People saw what was going on, but part of what we did as a region was to engage everybody in the region to help us plan the next steps, the next five rail lines. It led to the, the, the Railvolution Conference, is an outgrowth of an effort to try and build a regional consensus, building trust, and having the community help us design what went forward. Uh, the transportation class, City of Portland, is still something I think I'm the most proud of. We got some accomplishments moving forward in terms of transportation policy by taking opportunities for the people who were critics of everything we did and learn why we were doing it, how it worked. And over the years, as some of you know, we financed some of their class projects because they figured it out. And I think having an alumni association of several thousand people actually has helped that regional dynamic. We need to be doing things like that so that the public is a, a partner in these next steps, understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it. I fear that if we do not, we're going to have not just political problems, we're going to have uh, implementation problems, the notion of how conferences like this can expand the partnership, doing it with the public, designing solutions, involving them in it, and taking small steps that demonstrate that we can capture value, that we can share value, that we're going to commit to reducing income inequality. And for those days when the federal government gets back in the game, we'll revisit some really stupid things, like the largest transfer of wealth in American history, mortgaging your children's future, uh, and getting essentially nothing in return, except some people who didn't need it having more money, going back maybe and financing some of this infrastructure going back and changing the tax system so that it benefits the bottom two-thirds of society that are going to pay the economic price. We can create a grand bargain going forward. And the elements you're talking about here today, I'm convinced, will be its foundation. And I look forward to working with you in implementing it. Thank you very much.